being able to go through um, a differential diagnosis, being able to assess, being able to diagnose, being able to analyze all those critical thinking skills, I think they they translate very, very well to real estate. Um, you know, we love alg algorithms in medicine. Real estate can be very systematized and very prone to algorithms. What if you could reclaim hours of free time each week, create legacy building wealth, and devote more energy to your passion projects without giving up on your career as a life-saving MD? Dr. Vikram Raya is a functional cardiologist, high-performance coach, and real estate expert, is here to give you the tools, strategies, and solutions you need to transform your life. Unlock your limitless potential and achieve greatness, all while freeing up your precious time. Welcome to Limitless MD. Let's dive in. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Limitless MD. I'm your host, Vikram Ryan. Today, guys, I have a very special guest. He's known as the Cashflow MD. We have Danny Bramer. He is a doctor. Not only is he a doctor, he's an anesthesiologist. Uh, he's supposed to be somewhere in like some rainforest because he has a global health degree from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's worked in developing countries all over the world. Um, but somehow he's gotten into the real estate realm and he's amassed a $170 million portfolio, my friends. He's really done numerous things within real estate and he's trying to grow that and scale that as he as he takes over. Um, multiple different uh, uh, categories of dominance beyond his physician status. So, Danny, welcome to the show, and let's get right into it. Well, thanks a ton for having me on the uh, Limitless MD podcast, Vic. I really appreciate the way you continually give your time, your talents, and everything you have to to help your investor circle, whether it be from leveling up your health or your finances. I've definitely benefited from our relationship and I've learned a ton from you. So much appreciated. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Let's let's get into this thing. Like me and you go way back. And so we know uh, uh, each other's sort of backstory, but can you share with us a sort of the backstory of, okay, you're supposed to be in this realm of medicine, physician, trying to help the world. Explain to me how you're touring assets now and raising millions of dollars of, uh, of real estate money and, and and creating this amazing portfolio. Yeah, it's, it's a little convoluted. <laughs> so I, I'm the youngest of seven I'm from a big family. There were about nine of us growing up in a, in a very small house. My dad was a builder in the 70s. So a lot of high interest rates. We didn't have a lot of means growing up. But my dad did believe in hard work. He believed in character integrity, honesty. He walked those things out. He and my mom both walked those things out every day of their lives. And, you know, I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but I knew that I wanted to help people because I saw my parents do it all the time, whether it was with church or other organizations, they were always generous with their time and their finances. So fast forward to my first mission trip out of the country, it was Honduras. Um, I was absolutely hooked and medicine was where I wanted to be. I went back to medical school a little bit later in life. It didn't start until 30. So, and actually got my first taste of the possibilities of real estate when I use single family rentals and flipping homes to help pay for medical school. And then, oh, wow. What is your age now? I am 51 years old. I had to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Once you get over okay. 50, does it really even matter? Uh, <laughs> so, you, so 21 years where you developed this medical career, but to fund the medical career, you actually learned to do real estate. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So it, you know, started just flipping some homes and then kept some single family rentals and ended up selling a lot of those and helping pay for medical school. And then, you know, after residency, we moved to Alaska, which is quite literally the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. Had an unbelievable job, uh, had four kids, awesome wife, life was good. And then, you know, it started as a floater in my left eye um, while balancing my checkbook quickly turned into something that would change the trajectory of, of mine and my family's life forever. Um, after tons of testing, sleepless nights, we found that I had a progressive autoimmune condition that thankfully was only going to affect my vision, but it was eventually going to take away my ability to practice anesthesiology. That's my, my background. So I remember the day I had to call my partner my, my lead partner in the practice and tell him, man, I'm not going to be able to come in because I can no longer see well enough to do my job. And little how, how did many I know years that. ago was that? That was in 2013. Okay. Yeah. And so little did I know that ago, was, so you were given sort of quote unquote a death sentence, meaning you're essentially saying, Hey, 
how I could achieve my livelihood, you know, all the years I worked hard to become a, a physician could be taken away from me. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And that was a hard moment, a hard season, very tough to digest. You know, you know, all the years of hard work and dedication you put into medical school and residency. And if you have a family, you don't go through that by yourself. You go through it with them, right? So we're all invested. And those are and, some and, tough and, times. And, and Danny, I really want to pause there because you've shown so much guts, courage, tenacity uh, to overcome such a diagnosis or such a uh, sort of a curveball in your life. And so I know the people listening to this podcast are physicians, entrepreneurs, highly successful people who've been through you know, uh, their own struggles to get to where they are now. Um, but that being said, what advice, what strategy, how, how did you get over that? How did you recompose yourself and, and decide, hey, look, I'm going to forge a different future. That is not my destiny. Yeah, you know, I mean, really, Vic, my faith and my family were very, very, very integral in those times. And, you know, while I was, we were still searching for a diagnosis at that point, too. Um, but we also had to realize, you know, I had to put food on the table. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time to to really process and digest. And I, I think at that point, you know, my wife and I, like I said, our faith was very strong. We had been in Alaska for several years at that point, and we, we didn't feel like that was the end of our story. Um, so I, I started looking for different opportunities and, you know, there's tons of conferences out there as you're, as you're familiar with, there's a non-clinical position for physicians group out there. And I went searching for that and had an offer as a CMO, um, which I, I very seriously considered, but, you know, at some point I realized that all these are still jobs and I just had a job taken away from me mm. and we're all really just one catastrophic life event or a downsizing away from potential financial devastation. So I needed to prepare for a time when that a job or a circumstance was not going to dictate my fam my family's financial future. So that's the path we we chose. And you know, that's I was seeing firsthand how these things can be taken away from us. So it, it was really, really important for me, no matter what I chose, that a job or a circumstance was not going to dictate uh, my family's future. Now, that same thing happened to me during um, uh, yeah, during the the COVID uh, pandemic, where I had mm. a concierge boutique uh, functional medicine cardiology practice. Sure, yeah, I was shut down by you know the pandemic, and so thankfully I had started the real estate, and and it was really taking off, and so it is powerful like you say to take back matters into your own hands and so so now you're thinking hey i need to do something different um i have these op opportunities to work non-clinically maybe as a cmo or, or something else like that but mm -hmm. why, why real estate well you know i knew there were just a few main asset classes out there um which to invest you know we don't get a ton of financial education as physicians right but i did see my dad lose pretty badly in the stock market twice when he needed it the most he lost it during the dot com crash and then the great recession so paper assets really didn't hold a big appeal to me i didn't live in texas or oklahoma or north dakota and i had four of my buddies who were physicians that were kind of sideways in an oil and gas investment so i really wasn't interested in that asset class at that point um, lived in Fairbanks, Alaska. Gold fever was wild. Uh, you had tons of opportunities to invest in gold, but I felt like that was more speculating than investing at that point. And, and then came real estate. You know, I did, like I said, had some success flipping some homes and keeping some single family rentals in medical school. And then I read a book that should be required reading for any person looking to create wealth, which is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, of course. And, um, had a chance encounter with a medical school colleague at a wedding we're both in. And all these things kind of formed to really change the trajectory of mine and my family's life because I came to realize that assets that generate cash flow can last for generations and, and jobs don't. And I was really, really hooked at that point on real estate. And as all the physicians know that are listening right now, we learn a ton of medical school, but what you really learn uh, about your craft and how to hone it is in residency. So my business partner and I went out 
And we we sought mentors who were best in class and multifamily, and we paid them to teach us everything they knew about multifamily. And that was kind of back before there were the gurus and everything. So it was kind of hard to find them, but we did. And they opened up their book to us and taught us everything we knew. And, and he and I were able to scale very quickly uh, to over 800 units of multifamily in just a matter of a couple of years. But we had replaced our income as physicians in about 15 months after buying our first apartment complex. So that was definitely proof of concept to me. Congratulations, man. That's amazing. And uh, is this still your business partner to this day? Yeah, we're still friends and we still have business endeavors, but but as far as the cash flow MD, that's that's kind of a solopreneur type okay. investment for it, uh, adventure for me. That's yeah, awesome. we were we were heavily invested in multifamily and that's where we started. And and I really believe in diversification, uh, no matter what asset class you're in. Yep. So I started looking at different avenues in real estate and um was able to really because I believe in one, two, three, multiple passive or active income streams is a way to true generational wealth. And so, like I said, I'm an experiential learner. So I learned by doing. So I, I jumped into hotel and restaurant and event spaces and then bought Walgreens and Dollar Generals, other absolute triple net type of assets, and then timber and mobile home parks and self-storage and RV parks single family homes, short term vacation rentals, land, you know, both flipping it and developing it and private equity and debt. And it really, if it's something tangible that I can touch it and it has intrinsic value, then I'm I'm very interested in investing in and it. And are you the primary in all these? I used to be. We've never taken on limited partners up until this pat up till two years ago. So everything I have done has been with as a general partner or a, or a main sponsor. Was it challenging to learn all those different asset classes? I mean, I was trying to keep up. I was writing them down as fast as I could, but it's like nine or ten different asset classes. Yeah, I think it is. But I think, you know, as physicians, we're we're very well geared to do it. I mean, we're we're lifelong learners. We're curious by, you know, nature. And we learn by experience. So it, it was it was perfect, especially real estate. It's perfect for an experiential learner to jump in and really learn by doing. And I realized, you know, it was my main source of income and not a lot of other physicians are going to have the opportunity to do that. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to gain experience like you have, foster relationships and build a network of tons of different categories and asset classes over the years that, you know, I would like to leverage for 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 my group. And you know, I'm just curious because I think so many of the listeners will will want to know this. Uh, of all those uh, different investment classes, maybe you can share with the listeners what is the most profitable, perhaps, or what's the most has the most cash flow. We can start with that, and I, I can ask other follow up questions to that. I, I tell everybody the the kind of the same thing that I am really asset agnostic. <laughs> right. So what what that means but, is where. But, I'm gonna I'm gonna press you here because Danny, because sure. I, I think you have a ton of knowledge that I, I think my listeners can gain from. Uh, you may be agnostic, but there's a characteristic of each asset class. Which one typically have you found either has more cash flow or perhaps is more uh, can appreciate in value, or which one's more hands on, which is more hands off? Maybe you can give some of the characteristics of some of your favorites out of all these. So I think you know, obviously multifamily uh, was very, very cap rate compressed. And so we we kind of pivoted out of there. Um, I follow cash flow where I can drive appreciation and where I can realize the best tax advantages. So mobile home parks are a very strong player. RV parks are a very strong player as well. Those are a little more operationally intensive. However, they can still be systematized and automatized where you can work on it and not in it. Um, car washes, very, very profitable asset class that is kind of the darling of private equity right now. Those three offer tons of opportunities to drive appreciation, create cash flow, and give very good depreciation benefits. That's but, awesome, guys. Let's let me repeat that for the for the listeners here, guys. Mobile park, mobile home parks, RV parks, and what's the difference between? Uh, I guess mobile home parks are those um, more. People used to call them trailer homes, but these are really, they can be even nicer, but they're, they're, you're renting the land and people own the actual homes. Is that right? 
Well, there's different types of manufactured housing communities, and I, yeah. I use the old term, and now they're they're kind of rebranding themselves to the manufactured housing communities. There's only 44,000 in the nation, but the munis- municipalities are starting to understand that workforce housing is a massive, massive need right now. So for the first time in my lifetime anyway, they're actually – um, entitling new manufactured housing communities now. Okay. Um, it used to be you just couldn't get them entitled. So manufactured housing communities, generally what you want is to have the the dirt. You want it to have tenant-owned homes is what they're called, and then you just collect pad rent. Uh, but with these newer ones, people are actually purchasing new manufactured homes, bringing them in and and treating them, and not only treating them as uh, multifamily, but valuing them as multifamily via the NOI approach. Whereas if it's a manufactured housing community, you basically value it based on the pad rent only, and then the mobile homes or the manufactured homes are considered chattel, or you just pay for them individually. They're not factored in into the NOI. Got it. Um, whereas okay. these newer ones are, um, so you can you can actually now develop some manufactured home communities. It's not easy by any means, um, and there's not a lot of communities that are letting you do it. But in these areas that are booming and have workforce housing housing shortages, it's a really really strong play uh, to be able to to go in there and, and really create cash flow from day one. Yeah, that's very very powerful, and thank you for breaking that down because it really does make a lot of. A lot of sense the way you are able to talk about how we structure these kind of deals, how we gain the cash flow from them. Let's let's get, talk about car washes. Um, you know, when I first heard of this, I thought it was it was a joke. I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't serious, but I, you know, I recently shared the stage with um, uh, Shaquille O'Neal at, at, at a conference, and he was mentioning he was at one point he was the largest owner of car washes in like the southeast or something like that. So, uh, it is a powerful asset class that is now starting to come more institutionalized. Uh, can you share your thoughts on car washes? I think you hit the nail on the head there. It is becoming more institutionalized. Um, but right now, it kind of reminds me of mobile home parks four years ago. Right now, mobile home parks are being more and more consolidated. Um, and it, you know what I mean by consolidated is just that they're being gobbled up by larger institutional investors. Like multifamily is probably 60 plus percent consolidated, whereas mobile home parks are maybe 20 percent, where car washes are about 10%. So there's still a lot of opportunity to be able to um, purchase car washes from, from quote unquote mom and pops and be able to um, transform them into what we call express or tunnel car washes. Those are the ones that get the most cars through. You can sell subscriptions to, I mean, think about what private equity wants. They don't want anything that's labor intensive or management intensive. They want something that's turnkey and system and systematized, and that's what car washes can do for you. Not only that, they give you tons of depreciation. So, just for instance, like if you do a cost segregation analysis on an apartment complex, you'll likely get twenty percent of the value of the apartment complex upfront as accelerated depreciation year one. Whereas a car wash, you can get almost seventy percent upfront year one. So almost everything is depreciable. So it's in we're we're the, doing better than that on ours, but but yeah, those are those are some I was being robbers. conservative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so um and the the other thing is they are they really have strong cash flow associated with them. Yeah. Their EBITDA is is very, very high and their cash flow is very high as well. And yeah. as you package more and more, the EBITDA multiple increases. So, you know, if you can get 20, 30 plus car washes, you can look at some pretty high EBITDA multiples on exit. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, uh, I think Mr. Wash was a company that recently went public and they they had an IPO. And, and so it is really um, an interesting asset class. And then because it is sort of relevant to in the way people view real estate, uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap and some real estate operators are now starting to get into car washes. So that's, that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Let's, let's talk about this. Did you always know that real estate was the path or did you have at one moment, was there an aha moment that, Hey, this is something I should pursue. And the reason why I asked this is there's a lot of entrepreneurs on the show. There are a lot of physicians on the show who wanted to start a side hustle. They want to start something, but they're maybe vacillating between a couple of options or they're, they're mm-hmm. they're leaning towards something, but they're just not sure. 
how did you know oh that's it or was it was it a moment or was it sort of a gradual uh, uh coming coming of a decision i mean it sounds kind of cliche but i i think you know my my timeline was compressed right because i needed to find something but reading rich dad poor dad really did open my eyes to what is an asset what is a liability and then the the beauty of real estate is it can give you cash flow you can drive appreciation you get principal pay down by your tenants paying on your mortgage and you get amazing tax advantages i just could not find another asset class that offered all of that and if you look at how people get wealthy and how people stay wealthy and how people grow wealth, it's all real estate. 90% of the millionaires either made it, kept it, or grow it through real estate. So that's how I landed on real estate. You know, as a physician, uh, I, I think we're given a certain set of uh, skills or some superpowers. Which which one of these things as a physician do you think really helped you as an entrepreneur and as a real estate investor? What are, what are the things because of your medical background, do you think was advantageous? That's a really good question. I, I think, you know, just being able to go through um, a differential diagnosis, being able to assess, being able to diagnose, being able to analyze all those critical thinking skills, I think they they translate very, very well to real estate. Um, you know, we love alg algorithms in medicine. Real estate can be very systematized and very prone to algorithm. Uh, especially when it comes to due diligence and when you're filling out your performers and what your um, acquisition criteria are and those types of things. So there's a lot of crossover. And, and just to sort of uh, uh, dovetail that, so that's your superpower as a physician, but as a physician, sometimes we make a lot of mistakes in the business world. Can you share with us maybe some of the biggest mistakes you've ever made, especially in real estate? I think the biggest mistakes generally come when we think we need to move fast or there are, you know, there's some type of time constraint or, or FOMO, you know, not to make it trite, but fear of missing out. You know, I, I remember, you know, we, we were just growing. We're in the very beginnings of growing. This is after going through a, a, um, a mentorship with people who showed me the pathway, right? And, you know, we we gobbled up three apartment complexes. So we knew everything, right? So we we had a fourth that came our way. And, you know, it was a we it was a quick sale. They needed, they needed to close quickly. This was, you know, back in 2013, 2014. So there was still some distressed assets. So that wasn't uncommon. Um, we did not go through our entire due diligence checklist. We handed a lot of it off. Um, we had kind of created our own small property management, kind of like a, a special forces property management group that went in and with the really kind of heavy lift value add apartments. And long story short, we, we kind of cut some corners on due diligence. Um, and we ended up not doing a camera study, a sewer camera study, which I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but if you ever buy apartments, you need to know what that is. And we didn't do it. And within three months of owning it, we had a massive sewer issue on a, an apartment complex that was built on a slab. So you know how expensive that can be, right? Um, and this was us. We didn't have any investors. But if we would have had investors that had a preferred return, um, we would have basically worked that entire deal for free um, because we worked just enough and hard enough to get out from underneath it and you know leave with our skin intact. So I, I would just caution you to once you find a system that works, stick to it. Don't let people rush you or push you through it. Um, that's kind of one of my principles. Don't get emotional about a deal, right? Um, I don't care how much time you have involved in it. It's going to be a lot more time and effort trying to get rid of it. So that that was one of the one of the lessons we learned, thankfully, early on, and we we didn't take too big of a bath on it. And one of the things I, I I tell myself is the deal of the century comes along every week. So just, yeah. just yeah. pass and go to the it's next one. So right? It's so true. It's so true. Um, all right. Shiny you know, penny syndrome. Yeah. As we wrap up here, what advice do you have for newer doctors uh, getting into the entrepreneurial realm, whether it's real estate or not? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on how new you are. But what I would say to anybody just starting out is read voraciously. You know, it, it's the easiest way to learn from others and what they have done. It doesn't mean that you'll do what they do, uh, but it's a way to learn the space. And it's by far the cheapest form of education. I mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. 
Cash flow quadrants, another great one from mindset. You know, Tom Wheelwright's tax free wealth changed my life. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I just, that was just such an aha moment about real estate professional status and what that could do and what all that meant. Um, but the same goes with podcasts and YouTube and social channels and great content like you put out every single day. Facebook groups specific to sub, the subclass of investing that you're interested in. Those are great resources out there for absolute free. And then when you're taking the next step, you can really accelerate and compress time by finding a good coach, a good mentor, a good mastermind group like you and Peter have started. Um, I found mentors in the multifamily space and wow, did that compress our timeline. And I needed that. They weren't cheap, um, but it was a lot cheaper than doing it on my own and making horrible mistakes. So, you know, that can really accelerate your growth curve, expand your network and increase your network. And as we all know, our network usually equals our net worth. So as that expands, so does your network or your net worth rather. And then the last thing I would say is once you've learned and, pro and proven the concepts that you're learning, jump in. We as physicians tend to get analysis paralysis. You know, we feel like we need gonna, to be I was just going to sure. dive into that a little bit. Uh, how do you, <laughs> can you give us advice on how do you go from analysis? How do you go from analyzing to taking action? Because huh, a as a physician, we are paid to be very cautious and, and we're paid to make no mistakes. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. the opposite of being an entrepreneur. Help right. me understand how you bridge that gap. Right. I mean, we are we are told that if we make a mistake, people die. But what I have found, um, you know, if you need to be 100 percent sure about an investment before making the decision to invest, you're going to miss out on opportunities for absolute certain. Uh, I don't know of a way to be 100 percent sure about a situation in which there are variables. Right. So all I'm trying to do is decrease variables that will make the deal unsuccessful. If you've learned enough about the space, if you've done your due diligence, if you've ran it by your mentors and others in the space you know, or a trusted partner, people that you know, like, and trust, and that you feel it's a good deal at that point, then jump in. You don't have to spend everything on the first investment. You know, a lot of people, I want to put in 500,000. Well, you know, maybe just put in the minimum on this, but make sure it's going to hurt a little bit if you lose it, because it'll keep you interested. If you put enough money into it, you're going to keep your interest. And where your money goes, your mind usually follows. You'll learn every investment's a learning opportunity. And the more knowledge you gain and the experience you gain, the better investor that you become. Awesome, guys. That is brilliant. Um, so where can people find out about you, Danny? Where can they? Uh, and and I think you said uh, you had an uh, interesting resource you wanted to share with the audience. Um, maybe we can we can get into that. Yeah, absolutely, Vic. And, and once again, thanks for having me on. Before I give my information, I just want to share like one key concept that that I've shared in the past for my close friends and family and my kids, uh, especially as they come in, of age in this crazy economic climate. But all of this can seem overwhelming that we're talking about. You know, doctors are overworked and stressed, and this can elicit more fear and anxiety. And that's not what we're trying to do here at all. The best way to combat that is to just take a step. If you take a step, you're not stuck and you're making progress. And progress pounds out fear and really empowers us to do great things. So I'll kind of leave you guys with that. And if your listeners want to talk to me about that concept or really anything we've discussed, they can reach out to me by going to my website, which is dannybramermd.com, or they can just email me at danny at thecashflowmd.com. And also, I'd love to give your listeners um, my free ebook. It's, it's the six most frequently asked questions that I'm asked by doctors that I'm talking to, um, generally about real estate investing, but it, it delves off into a few other things like your tax team and stuff like that. They can get that by going directly to thecashflowmd.com. Uh, thecashflowmd.com. So just want to thank you again for having me. The work you do to empower physicians is, is super inspiring. And this has been an amazing conversation. And so I just want to thank you for all you do to bring uh, value to, to your listeners and to me. I've learned a ton from you. Danny, thank you so much. Uh, and guys, just as we wrap up here, the, here's some of, some of the highlights that I, I learned. Um, you know, some of the biggest mistakes in real estate is rushing the process and not trusting the process. So make sure you trust the process and do your due diligence and know that like 
you know, an Alaskan doctor given a, a sentence of I'm going to go blind in the next, you know, five years, he spun that challenge into a courageous crusade into a new way of life. And he was able to create multiple streams of income, not only for himself, but that he grew the wealth of physicians and others around him. He used faith, he used family as food for the fuel to traverse that challenge. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, uh, advice for doctors, you know, read the good books, get the good mentors, get the good um, conferences. And, and then finally take action, go beyond the uh, limiting beliefs that we have and just take that progress forward. And like he said, progress pounds out the fear. So thank you again, Danny. And uh, guys, until next thank time, you. be phenomenal. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Limitless MD. If you found value from this episode, I encourage you to share this episode with a friend and let me know by leaving a review. For more information, make sure you check out the links in the show notes below or simply visit vikramraya.com. Until next time, be phenomenal. Phenomenal.